Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. Our guest today is Dan Burkoff, who is the co-founder and CEO of NAMI. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, uh, excited to dive in today and learn more about your background and, of course, that of the company, what you guys do there at NAMI. So why don't you start with there, uh, start there, give us a brief history of, of the organization and, and yourself and how you found yourself at NAMI. Yeah, so a couple year a couple years ago we started Nami. Uh, so I'll maybe start with the history first because it informs why we started the company. Um, I've been in the mobile space for the last uh, ten plus years. Uh, first, I built an agency that uh, had a bunch of really great customers. Uh, kind of the most impressive of which were a lot of the professional sports leagues uh, and global news broadcasters. And we even had an airline in there as well. So what we were doing as at the agency was building some of the, you know, first and most kind of impressive apps um, as, as those brands were entering mobile for the first time or entering kind of the world of set top boxes and OTT platforms for Mm -hmm. the first time. And they needed a trusted partner that could not just develop the code to get there, but really help them embrace the unique characteristics of each platform. Just to look at mobile for a second, I mean, uh, an iPhone works totally differently than an Android phone. So when a brand's trying to execute on both, they they need to make sure at least the best brands will try to say, well, how do we deliver the best iPhone experience and how do we deliver the best Google Play Android experience without trying to do kind of one thing, we want one app that looks exactly the same across both. And I say, look, I don't mean design exactly, although that's a part of it. So from the agency, uh, which I sold to WPP, the world's largest advertising holding company, um, we, I I and a co-founder started Push.io, which was one of the early pioneering companies in push notifications. You know, nowadays, push notifications are sort of, you know, we were inundated by them. Yeah. Um, in those early days, we were helping folks, again, like the sports leagues, get critical information like sports scores uh, to fans that wanted that information. Uh, so uh, we built a fantastic engine that would do that blazing fast in a really personalized way. Uh, that So we had great customers. Um, we, we caught the attention of some folks inside of a, a group um, uh, that was that ended up being the Oracle Marketing Cloud. Okay. Um, and that's a division of Oracle that's focused on marketing technology. So we got acquired. Our technology became the mobile channel for the Oracle Marketing Cloud, uh, where you could orchestrate alongside push notification, things like email messages, display advertising. So kind of the, the end user is getting the right marketing kind of at the channel they want okay. to get it. Um, and not, um, you know, necessarily blast it to, to all the places. So we spent a few there years there. And one of the, when we were leaving to decide to do something new, there was a couple of observations. Um, number one was that Apple and Google were, and Apple in particular, was really starting to encourage app developers to adopt subscription-based business models. Uh, that started, you know, about five years ago was the start. And then it's really started to accelerate. But the second thing was the learning from Oracle uh, was that, you know, as the end of the quarter would come along and some of these businesses were trying to drive results, uh, the number one tool they would have in their tool set, uh, maybe to our chagrin, well, you know, for the business, not to our chagrin, but to end users to our chagrin is that, oh, well, we're we're a little soft on numbers. Let's just send a big email blast out and see if we can drive some uh, commerce uh, towards the end of the quarter. And so what we were trying to figure out is, is there an opportunity to do a couple of things? Number one, help mobile developers uh, implement subscriptions more easily. Uh, and that's important because you're building you're building kind of to, with deep technical APIs. Uh, it's not as plug and play as it might be on the web. So developers are spending a, a lot of we're, we're spending a lot of time just trying to kind of monkey with the plumbing even though apple was handling the payments google was handling the payments just even trying to orchestrate that life cycle of the subscriber um, was sort of for a foreign language for a lot of these developers and involved a lot of back and forth both on the client side on the app and then you know server side technologies to kind of get updates when people renew or when these different uh, life cycle events 
uh, took place. So job one was, let's just make a lot of that easier. Um, so that like we did with push notifications by making it, you know, you can stand up a push notification system with one line of code. What if we could stand up a subscription system with again, kind of a line of code to get going instead of weeks and weeks of work. But then what we realized is that, uh, mobile developers, um, uh, are just like normal you know, brands and normal developers where to, to actually market the thing they're trying to sell, uh, there's not a lot of tools. Mm -hmm. A lot of the tools are advertising somewhere, um, building a list and then advertising to that list in the form of email marketing. Uh, and, uh, and then via you know, word of mouth or social oriented things, uh, perhaps, uh, as well, content marketing and the like. So, but one of the things that's really, really well refined in the mobile space is acquisition. There's all sorts of technologies out there and companies that let you pay, uh, it's a CPI, a cost per install to acquire new users to your app, to you know, get them to download it and install it. Um, so that's, that's like a well-oiled machine. Now there's varying quality of the, of the sure. traffic that you get. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to light up a campaign like that and have some budget, well, you're going to show up with some downloads. Um, but then what? Yeah. And what we saw when we embarked on this is that what a lot of app developers were doing because they didn't know any better was the first time one of these users would come in the front door, they were promoting the subscription right away uh, and, 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 and basically banging people over the head with it. Mm. And in mobile, a lot of experiences are freemium. So, you know, people weren't even giving users the space to even see like, is this the app I want? Yeah. Right. right. Is this doing the thing I care about? Um, so anyway, a long winded way of saying there's a lot of unique problems in kind of these mobile first businesses that want to adopt subscriptions and we're trying to just streamline it and make it as easy as possible. So what does that integration look like? You said one line of code. Is it truly that easy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably three lines of code when you import our module and, uh, you know, uh, run the setup thing with your API key. But then it's like the line of code that says raise the paywall. Yeah. And that's the moment that you can invoke a purchase experience um, and offer, uh, you know, a user to to uh, purchase your subscription. But importantly, that raise the paywall is tied to business logic that sits in our cloud so that you don't have to hard code any of that in your app like you would have in the old days. You just go into our platform and say, oh, you want it to show up every third time the user comes to the app? Okay. You want to tie it to a specific action that they've taken in the application. Mm -hmm. That's one of those signals that they might be a likely purchaser. Those are the kind of things you can do with our platform. So a lot less code, but also a lot more control to kind of twiddle and experiment once you've gotten to market. So it sounds like you also then take that capability out of the hands or or of a localized developer into a market actual marketing person at some of these that's right yeah that's exactly right and so exactly the playbook we're trying to recreate um, that we saw in the push notification space which was the early buyers the the develop the the the, the early buyers of that technology were often the the chief technology officers or the heads of product development but over time it became the marketing function or the cmo or the pnl owner that started to say well how can push notification be part of our kind of suite of capabilities to to really um, uh, message and market to and create engagement with our our users with the goal being that some users will turn into paying customers some paying customers will become you know whale customers and um, you want to create a strategy that you can align your marketing activities including push uh, towards finding the, these these people and and marketing the right product to them. Uh, so our playbook here is the same, which is let's get it out of developers' hands as quickly as possible and put the control in the hands of product people, marketing people, non technical roles to really iterate and experiment as quickly as possible. Um, because guess what? Like you're not going to get it right the first time mm -hmm. in terms of price point or the marketing copy. I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's right. kind of so obvious, but, uh, because of the nature of mobile apps, a lot of this stuff tends to be coded in and marketers end up saying, well, can I do this? And the development guy will come back and say, 
well, that'll be an app update and I can get slot that in in six weeks. And, and that's usually by then the marketer has a new idea and they want exactly. to move on. <laughs> Their requirements have already changed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that happens all the time. Well, so besides on the marketing side of things, once that customer then says, yeah, this is an offer I'm interested in, what are the problems downstream of that do you guys solve? Yeah, so uh, th there's there's a host of things. Um, kind of the, the big buckets are uh, kind of the, the purchase experience that's aligned to the life cycle. So just because somebody okay. took you up through the paywall, uh, uh, the cloud paywall of the free the conversion to a free trial, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to stick in uh, when the trial is over or um, there's other life cycle events. And in mobile in particular, there are uh, different things that can happen on different platforms. For example, uh, in the Android ecosystem, a user can pause their subscription uh, um, on Google Play. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily say, hey, your product's lousy. I don't want to pay anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just saying, hey, I just need to take a break, either, you know, financial reasons or, or otherwise. And you as the publisher, the brand needs to be able to he not, not only hear that signal, but then put the right thing in front of the user, be it gate their access or not gate their access, right? If somebody's paused, um, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, pull the rug underneath uh, yeah. them. It means uh, maybe on the next renewal, it, it's time for them to lose access if they don't unpause, um, maybe. Uh, or maybe you just allow them to be in a pause state for a period of time. I mean, you might have mm -hmm. your own business rules around what does pause mean to us? Because it, it's, yeah, it's a, a the revenue exchange is kind of taking a break, but that doesn't mean the relationship is, is taking right. a break. So, right. and then there's other signals, right? People might signal that they're going to cancel, but that cancellation may not turn into a, an expiration of the subscription until the, the bill term uh, is the next bill term. And so what marketing or what strategies do you want to put in front of, of that user to either try to win them back or reassert the value proposition? That may be very different from how you would treat uh, the person coming in the front door the first time. And so we help you organize the marketing activities across the life cycle of the subscriber. And then the other thing though, that's really vital in, in the space we operate is that supporting these users is really challenging. Uh, and that is because uh, they're not just buying in one place. They're not just buying on the app store or just on Google play or just directly from you on the web or just on a Roku system. They can be coming from any one of those places for some of these brands selling digital subscriptions. And so uh, in the old days, or you know, even for people that aren't using our technology, the way you support a customer uh, is very broken. You see like tons of one-star reviews in the App Store and Google Play around kind of support issues related to subscriptions. Um, and it's often because there's just a, 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 a breakage in the data. So the brand gets an inbound support request saying, you know, how do I downgrade? I want to downgrade my subscription and the, the support rep might know who that is, but they may not know who, where they bought that, the subscription mm -hmm. from or through. And so then the first question is, well, where'd you buy it? Okay. I bought it on Google play. And then the support rep has to go, you know, then, then they get the answer. Now they're going to a knowledge base and saying, well, what do I do on downgrades on Google play? And then they push that information back to the user. The user is confused yep. because all the management doesn't happen in the app itself. It happens in the Google Play app. So then you're mm -hmm. going back and forth, back and forth. And now the user is getting frustrated instead of, you know, just solving their problem. So we provide a, a bunch of tools that give the brands uh, better supportability of these subscriptions. Uh, in part because we're giving visibility to where people are buying, but then we're also giving them uh, capabilities to as quickly as possible kind of solve the issues um, that's compatible with kind of those different capabilities that exist. Because it's very different mm -hmm. the tools you have in your arsenal on Google Play than it is on the App Store, for example. On Google Play, you can issue a refund with one button. On the App Store, uh, you can't do that as a brand. Um, you'll be, you might be able to do that with iOS 15, but as of today, you can't do that. And so for the support person to know what the range of tools are at their disposal is also really important because if, if, yeah. they, if they're confused and the user's confused and everybody's confused, then we have unhappy subscribers. Right. Right. 
Well, I, I'm curious. Uh, a lot of the things you've talked about are specific to like the the Google App Store and Google Play Store and, and Roku and things like that. You talked about customers buying from a lot of different places, which might be direct from you through a you know a web store or even a, maybe a mobile optimized site or something like that. How do you kind of bring those very different ecosystems together? Yeah. So we're really focused on digital subscriptions, but you're right. There's digital subscriptions that uh, are sold direct through a website or a mobile website uh, uh, or, or in some other way. There's even, you know, um, uh, affiliate and kind of partnership based things where you might sell the subscription in bulk. And then there's a way that mm -hmm. the user can you know, get access uh, to it. Um, and so the short answer is that similar to how we support the underlying technologies to deliver uh, on mobile through the App Store and Google Play through APIs that are provided by those platform vendors. We also support, you know, and we don't support everything, but we support some of the popular, you know, wet, things that people use for, for example, SaaS apps. And so some people like to implement subscriptions through Stripe. And so we have a Stripe module so that if you want to use our kind of abstraction layer that offers a bunch of cool things, but, you know, you want to sell Un, the manage the underlying billing and, and transaction through Stripe, you can do that. We'd like to support other yeah. la, other layers in that bucket over time. Um, and then, you know, it's like, it's, it's kind of like, we don't care where you're selling. We want to make it easier for you to sell all those places and, uh, and market and service your users effectively. Yeah. Would you say, would it be fair to say that for the average uh, merchant that is trying to sell in, in all of these different areas, it often takes, if you're selling in five places, five different subject matter experts who have to constantly not get to know it the first time, but keep up with how it's changing over time. Then they have to work together to bring all of this you know, into one place in order to abstract it for that particular organization. And that's really the pain point that you're trying to take away from them. Yeah. I mean, the concrete examples I alluded to iOS 15, Apple had their developer conference last week. Uh, we put a newsletter out on Friday that was like one of the longest email newsletters we've done. Um, and it wasn't because we like to write long emails. It's because there was just so many underlying technology changes that are touching this area that we wanted to try to summarize it as concisely as we could for our customers with the you know bottom line message of, oh, by the way, as much as this means there's change, some of the change is good because it's new capability. Some of the change is technical debt that Apple's trying to pay down. Um, they, but no matter what, you don't have to worry about it. We've got it, you covered, uh, because we're going to adopt all these new things, make sure you have backwards compatibility. So you'll have the latest Apple standards and you'll have the new capabilities. And hopefully it means you have zero worries when the new OS ships uh, this fall. And so, and that's just one platform, mm -hmm. right? right? We, we talked to, um, we have a customer that when we first engaged with them said, he gave us a, a little story. And the story was last year, and this was now a couple of years back. Last year, we had an executive come in and it was a very senior executive that said, hey, I've got an idea for a new plan, a new tier of, of our subscription at a lower entry price point than what they had offered before. And because it came from this executive that was very senior, there wasn't a lot of internal sort of, well, should we do this? Shouldn't we do this? It was basically marching yep. orders. And what they described to us is to get that to market across 14 different platforms where they offered subscriptions. So you can imagine, where, what are 14? Well, mobile phones, you know, OTT boxes like Roku, game consoles directly on the web, the mobile web. You know, suddenly you end up in that ballpark. Uh, it it cost them uh, more than like almost a year of effort, um, seven figures of development fees, uh, and then they they shipped and you know all was well, right? No, all was not well because they get to market and nobody wants this new product. Like the the sales didn't even get. I think it was like tens of thousands of dollars for a seven figure plus investment, um, all because. It wasn't because the they didn't challenge the assumption of should we do this. It's a little more subtle than that. It's because they didn't have the capabilities to try it cheaply mm. and abandon it if it didn't work. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we're trying to solve is, hey, try new things. That's how you grow. That's how you scale up is by experimenting, learning, and trying the next thing um, 
as you keep going along. Yeah, I love that example. I, I've been in subscriptions for 20 years. And when I started, we were working on VAX systems and AS400s and, and, and things like that that managed our subscription. So you can imagine the life cycle when, when somebody wanted to introduce a new feature or put something, a new product out into the market. It was, it was pretty extensive. Um, so, you know, where things sit today, there's so many great providers and platforms like yours, like ours, that are actually trying to do exactly that, to obfuscate some of the things that are going to happen and change and allow you to iterate and innovate a heck of a lot faster. To your point, try things, see if it's actually going to work before we're going to make a wholesale commitment to this thing yeah. and a year's worth of, of time and effort uh, and you know valuable resources put into it. So I think that's one, the most important thing that's changed about subscriptions uh, for as long as I've been doing it, at least. Yeah. The barrier to entry, I mean, and some of these things now will, will you know, it, I'm talking about cross-channel digital subscriptions. Yeah, you know, there's e-commerce subscriptions. I know that that is closer to your world um, or SaaS subscriptions. There's, um, uh, e you know, even the business of running subscription businesses, I think now is like a, a $10 billion, you know, business, right. just that the business of running subscriptions. And so... Uh, but it, what that sector says to me is that people want to do this, but there is a lot of pain and um, they need help with the pain. And so they're willing to buy tools, even part give, give up some of their revenue, uh, you know, especially if it's through a SaaS model where there might be some usage fees or some, you know, tie to, to the subscriptions themselves mm -hmm. um, or the revenue streams. They're willing to do that if it helps them get to market faster, right. if it helps them manage these things over time, not get stuck in these legacy systems uh, stories and so on. Right. Well, and if you think about it, this is kind of the inevitable place that this was coming to because with so many subscription offerings out there now, whether it's digital and OTT or e-learning all the way down to box of the month clubs and things like that in subscription, there's so much choice right now. Yeah. And if you don't start up a good service that people like and, and have a good product to go along with it, there's somebody else that's starting up someone probably not far behind you. So to be able to iterate you know, and innovate and get speed to market faster than ever before is kind of, it's, they're almost table stakes now, right? You can't go out and spend three years building up your platform to launch your product because by the time you do, it's obsolete anyway. Um, uh, so I, I think that's, again, kind of the big thing that has changed that's really pretty critical for, for anybody trying to get into this space, let alone try to scale up their subscription business. I think one of the things that that also relates to is that, uh, now the, the t types of modern technologies that people are using to deliver these kinds of experiences or these kinds of services, uh, have certain characteristics. For example, by and large, these things tend to be easier to cancel than the old yeah. subscriptions, you know, of the sure. past. Now, some of that might've been the legacy systems, uh, had challenges processing cancellations and some of it could have been intentional right. because, you know, you wanted to, uh, have retention programs that would phone trees and retention mm -hmm. people that would help you, uh, uh, keep, keep that. But nowadays it's like, if I have the choice between, between a subscription that I can cancel, by the way, canceling doesn't mean it's the end right, of the relationship. It it, it's just a moment. Mm -hmm. It, you can always get that user back. Um, it, the, and let me say it a different way. The user may always want, may, may be willing to at some point come mm -hmm. back. It depends on how you right. treat them. So if you make it really hard to cancel, you know, that's why some of the telcos have awful um, customer service records and, you know, complaints is because they make it so hard. And so guess what? Like you'd almost rather snip the landline or snip the cable the service from your house and go streaming only because you just, it's just not a necessity anymore, especially if they're going to make, if they're going to make it easy, then that's one thing. If they're going to make it a challenge and make you go through hoops, then, then that's a totally different thing. And by the way, once you cut the landline or, or get rid of the cable uh, subscription, you're never coming back. Yeah. I mean, never. Right. Uh, right. So, but if you had made it easy, maybe there's a different v flavor of their product in a, in a new iteration, maybe it's, you know, they have a streaming service that you'd consider right. based upon how you, they treated you, um, with the traditional product. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a really good point. I like that perspective. Um, one of the things that was attractive to me years ago about cutting the cord was 
going over to these OTT streaming services who built digital first companies who just knew how to treat a customer, you know, and I could go online and see that, oh, there is a cancel button. I didn't have to call giant cable company who shall remain nameless and, and talk to three different people, you know, just to cancel my service, let alone, you know, ever start it up again. Um, so yeah, it, it was just kind of that man mentality. I think that's a really good point is, uh, you know, that's just kind of where we're at now. That's what consumers expect. And um, even if, you know, they come up, the, the, the legacy companies come up with these services, I'm going to, it's ingrained in my mind that, yeah, I remember that experience with you. I remember how miserable that was. And I, if I have choice over here, that's probably where I'm going to go. But it's not everybody's doing this. I mean, even, even the modern companies, and we had an experience with a tool, a SaaS tool that we were using for our, in our development team. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, I think the company might be, might be, on the cusp of an IPO or something. I mean, so it's a, it's a, it's a unicorn kind of bigger, okay. big, 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 fast growing startups. So you would think that digital first company, they, they grew fast. There must be a reason for that. You know, they must be doing all the, all the right things. You know, we had a puny little contract with them because, you know, where the scale that we were flowing through their system was, was a drop in the bucket, but yet they still made it a, a hassle to cancel. We had to talk, not only did we have to talk to somebody, but, they still charged our credit card for the next billing term because they were out of the office on the Friday. Oh my gosh. And you know, then the bill hits and it's, and so we're having to like chase them down for a refund and, and they're not responsive to that. And then they're, they're, they're forcing us to, you know, threaten to write lousy reviews and all this other stuff that we don't like, that's not in our DNA to want to just go be nasty. And, um, and, and guess what they, in their category is, this is in a developer tool kind of space. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of companies and a lot of competitors and, um, we chose them because they were one of the larger ones and well-known, but guess what? Um, if this is how now they're never going to be a choice again, yeah. if we get to a different stage of our company where we need the kind of completeness of their offering, we're always going to look for an alternative with great and um, uh, great vigor based upon the way they, they treated yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not only are you not coming back as a customer, you're probably not referring anybody else that way. Yeah. Which is, which is really important, uh, especially now. What do you see in terms of, uh, you, you had alluded, you had talked about, you know, the pause feature um, in the Google Play Store, them having that feature. We've talked to a lot of, you know, online businesses which are implementing that, that feature as well. What else is out there in terms of the subscription life cycle that can kind of differentiate somebody um, in, in terms of feature? What do you see as the next big things coming? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, especially these consumer services that, not a lot of people take advantage of, but they probably should is, is thinking about kind of the, the family plans, so to speak, okay. um, or family sharing. Uh, how many of us, you know, have live in a household where we're all subscribed to a certain digital newspaper, even though we'd gladly pay for the family membership, just have one billing relationship, but multiple users, um, and, and there's a host of other products like that, uh, in, not just in the newspaper space, but really in, in across a lot of different categories where I think that's an untapped opportunity to generate more incremental revenue, get people on a stickier skew. Um, but, uh, uh, but it, but kind of ease their pain, you know, ease the pain on the flip side of managing that and feeling like you're not necessarily paying twice, even if the family plan is, is more expensive. Um, so I think that's one thing. And then I think there's an, another opportunity, which is around, um, so I have to be careful about how I say this. Uh, we, in the mobile world, the the billing relationship lives between the the end user and the, the app store operator. Right. So Apple or Google Play or, you know, the Roku store or the you know, uh, Tizen store or what, what you name it, um, the Samsung store. I think there's an opportunity for brands to do a, to get sophisticated about how they ensure that they also have a relationship with that end user and one that uh, over the kind of arc of time uh, gives them an opportunity to sell direct to the user. And I don't mean selling direct in like a sneaky, let's steal them away from Apple kind of way. I just mean um, making the relationship a broad relationship 
you know, uh, you make, make the brand, not just a, um, here's an example, like more of a Peloton style engagement where people are very engaged with that brand. Um, people that have Peloton love Peloton, um, versus a small little utility you get on the app store where, yeah, you need Apple to be the, in charge of that relationship because you as a no name application don't have any brand yeah, recognition or credibility. Right. But as you get larger and larger as a brand, I think you have an opportunity not to not to disrupt the payment gateway or mechanism, but just to sort of really focused on your direct brand relationship and whatever that may mean. Um, and it may affect where the you know how, what what the subscription, where the subscription life cycle is managed, how it's managed. And how these channel partners like Apple are kind of a part of the story, but not the full story. Sorry to be so vague, but um, we've, there's some things we're working on in this regard, and I, I think they're uh, interesting. Well, uh, you know, uh, this may be what you're alluding to, maybe not, but there's always going to be, or well, there has been this push-pull between Google and, and Apple in particular wanting to have control, right? They want to be in the middle of that relationship. They want to prove your app before you put it up on the app store. They want to own the billing relationship. They just love being in the middle of that. And they love taking a third of your revenue in the process, which has kept a lot of providers or, or merchants out there from wanting to go in that direction. They feel like they are going to give up the control. They're going to give up revenue. So what do you say to that? Do you, do you think they're getting the message and seeing that maybe we are actually leaving some opportunity on the floor, Google and Apple that is, or do you think merchants are, you're, you're kind of strong armed here and you don't have much of a choice? I think it, no revenue share is ever going to be too little. So if they cut it in half to 15 or cut that in half again mm -hmm. to seven and a half, um, I think, I, I kind of think eventually we'd all be back at the same place where, because, and, and why is that? Um, I think it's because the, you can't grow revenue fast enough. So then you start mm -hmm. to look at margin, right? If we're growing revenue fast enough and our churn is reasonable, um, then, um, then who cares? Um, yeah. on some level now, some, you know, somebody in accounting mm -hmm. cares, but, but fundamentally, if it's like up and to the right and that channel is bringing you a lot of audience. And I guess that's where the argument for some of these big companies comes into is if you're Peloton or Netflix, you're saying, well, wait a second, Apple's not bringing me audience. Apple's a conduit for delivery right. of my technology that people are going to come looking for anyway. So why am I giving up, um, uh, you know, 30%, but even so, I think that a, a smaller cut would result in, in the same kind of general tension um, as people. So, so I think what it is, is that um, my, my viewpoint is that I would like to see a little bit less. Um, I, I think we need to get more sophisticated on the acquisition side to try to find the right audience for our products. So we stop spending so much energy on like the churn metric. Mm -hmm. I think the churn metric is a lousy metric, not because it doesn't say something important, but because what's really happening, what's really happening is that human beings are canceling your service or your product and you're dehumanizing it by calling mm. it churn instead of trying to figure out, well, why is it that people are canceling at a rate that's outside of the competitive yeah. set? Is it because your product is failing to deliver? Um, is it because you're acquiring lousy audience that isn't right. a match for the product you're trying mm -hmm. to sell? Uh, yeah, they're installing. Yeah, they're you know signing up for an account, but then they're realizing, well, wait, well, what is this? What is this thing I even got myself into? You know, I think there's a lot of that out there that kind of gets masked by um, how easy it is to acquire um, without knowing like who is it that we're acquiring and what are they doing and how and how are they responding the, to the product that. And, and are you like, are you kind of scamming them into that free trial because it's a free trial and they don't really know what yeah. it is they're even right. getting into? I think there's, there's a, lot a lot of that, of that out there. there. Absolutely. There is. Um, if, if, if chargeback rates are any indication of that, that there is absolutely that sort of deceptive marketing happening where, you know, some of this sometimes is on consumers, but there's a heck of a lot of ways that merchants can make it more apparent to you're buying something here. We're charging you now. We're going to charge you again. You know, that just 
I mean, Visa, MasterCard are trying to put regulations out there to make that more uh, clear to consumers, but you know, they can only do so much. Ultimately, this is on the merchant. So I, I like what you said there about, you know, putting this word churn on something that, uh, you know, otherwise is, you know, it's customers canceling. It is a human being saying, I don't want your product anymore, you know, in one way or another. And we've put this yeah. uh, label on it, though we all still kind of kind of dance around that metric, right? You know, I bring it up on this show all of, all of the time to talk about what are you doing? And nobody ever wants to talk about their churn rate. You know, they don't want to talk about the rate at which customers, people are leaving them because that has a bad connotation with it. But, um, you know, it, it, it can be, to your point, an indication of a lot of other things that you, you might need to address. The easiest possible thing one can do if they want to grow is spend more on acquisition. You just spend mm -hmm. more money and you have more signups. You have more signups that convert into trials. You have more trials that, you know, recur for some number of billing periods. Um, but the consequence is, depending on that acquisition strategy and where you acquire and how you acquire it and the effectiveness of the campaign, uh, you may pay for it later, so to speak, with uh, that churn metric. Um, so this is the this is just a classic problem of of back to my end of quarter riff earlier about the email marketing, mm -hmm. right? At the end of the quarter, you know, mark, you know, the numbers aren't where we want it to be. So let's turn on more Facebook ads, yeah. even if we don't know 100% that the ads are going to generate um, the kind of subscribers that we want. And what are the kind of subscribers we want? Do we really want people that are just in for three months until they realize that they're pay paying for something they don't use? use? Or do we want people that will be with us for two, three, four, or five years? Absolutely. Well, and, and I think we've all been there at this point, but there's subscription can make sense in a whole lot of places, but there are still situations where it doesn't make sense, or at least what you're doing is inviting a cancellation because somebody is only going to sign up with you to use your service for one particular thing, edit a video or you know something like that, where it's like, I just need to use it now. You're only offering me subscription. So... I'll sign up to use it today, but I'm going to cancel in the future without, you know, putting a different type of offer out there that meets what the consumer actually needs, right? Well, then, so let's make sure we do an exit survey, you know, glean some of those insights. And, and then if maybe there are other things that the user would pay, would continue to pay if you had in your mix, or um, based upon the survey results, you know how you know, the right cadence in which to re-engage them the next time they're going to need you for a moment right. in time. Because guess what? What is a string of a couple of moments in time where they might use you once? Yep. It's kind of a subscription, yeah. but just not the durations that, you, you know, perhaps you're packaged and offering. Yep. So wouldn't you rather that than a one-time relationship uh, that's, you know, take it or leave it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's that's what we want. Even if you're not subscription, even if you are just just retail, we all want that continuing ongoing engagement from the consumer. Right. It's just with a with a subscription, that cadence is more controlled than if you're selling, uh, you know, toilet paper. Right. You, you're probably going to sell it w once per, per month to, to a customer. Right. You just want it to be your brand over and over again. It's just not guaranteed. So uh, that I, I think in the end, that's something that we all want and can and can shoot for. But uh, to your point, I think making it, it putting that product out there in a way that the consumer, even if they truly only need you once for now, it's going to think about you in the future when they inevitably need you for something similar to that. Right. I mean, that that's what we're all going for. We want those repeat customers. Yeah. Cool. Well, so in, in terms of your, your product and, and platform, are there anything that you want to share with us today about where you're headed and where you see the, the opportunities in, in the mobile subscription space? Sure. I mean, for, for one thing, it's, it's, it's a growing space. I mean, just that sector, I think UBS came out and said by 2025, uh, digital subscriptions are going to double um, I think to something like $1.5 trillion, um, by 2025. So that's, that's large, but where mobile apps are today, just mobile app, uh, spending digital, um, um, uh, consumer spending, uh, is 270 billion, um, already. So, so that's large and that's been growing like wildfire. Um, that's a mix of in-app purchases, one-time purchases and, um, subscriptions, all those subscriptions are, growing way faster than the market and um, 
in-app purchases tend to skew towards the game space Mm -hmm. Um, and games have kind of been lagging in terms of adoption of subscription, which I I think will quite frankly change over time because I think there's going to be a bit of fatigue to uh, there. There already is fatigue to like, do I really have to buy another you know, gold coin pack to keep playing this game. Yeah. Um, right. You know, in the old days, I would just like buy the cartridge and then I get to play the whole game. Uh-huh. And yeah, the cartridge was sixty bucks, but um, at least I got a lot of gameplay before you you know hit me up again. Um, so big market, you know, very much still growing. Um, but for me, what I you know one of the things I'm most excited about is you know, we talked a lot about how we're trying to help on the kind of marketing side and and shift some of the control to market marketers and marketing function, and how we're trying to kind of provide more capabilities to support your subscribers, um, so deliver better customer support. Mm-hmm. But where I see all this coming together is through automation, and uh, you know our company name is Nami, but there's another part of that which is Nami ML. So machine learning is a big part of how we think right. about the future. And so let me tell you about how how, how automation, I think, uh, plays. Um, so we've been building kind of, you know, this isn't the number one thing we focus on every day and, and not what's driving the commercial side of our business at the moment. It's kind of the sleeping giant, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been assembling the world's first that we know of uh, machine learning data set that's built around kind of predicting and mobile first, to be clear, there may be other things in e-commerce and other places, but the first data set that um, has learned how to predict key moments in the subscriber journey. And so with billions of data points collected, what it means is that we think brands can start to automate both marketing and support even uh, around what, what, where is the customer? Where is the subscriber in the, in the journey? But more importantly, where are they about to be? Mm -hmm. So, uh, they are paused right now, but they're about to not be paused or they, they're in a free trial, but they're not, they're about to not be in a free trial. Um, and, and hopefully, and we're predicting that they're going to turn into a paying customer based upon their usage patterns, um, in the experience. They're not going to cancel because people that cancel would show fatigue during the free trial, for example. Yeah. And so yeah. we think automation is going to be a game changer for making the life cycle like come to life in these these kind of magical experiences that just eliminate even more friction uh, that, than than they're already you know they're, we're already in a world where these modern tools have less friction, like we talked about with cancellation. But what if they could be even better where you know, a customer could like even support themselves, right? Mm-hmm. How, how would they support themselves or how would they, how would they, I, I, there's a great example, um, the website uh, hosting company Squarespace. Yep. So Squarespace has a um, free trial. I think it's seven or 14 days. And when you, exp- when you, you run out of the free trial, they send you an email. And that email says, you know, sorry, uh, you know, it's time to upgrade, basically time to upgrade your, fri- your trial's over. But then they have this little link at the bottom under the button that says upgrade that says, do you need mo- seven more days with like seven more days of your free trial help? And if you push that button, which I did once, I thought, well, what's going to happen? Is this going to open a chat widget? And am I going to get like, now I'm going to be in a, or, or am I going to be sub- submitting a support ticket or are they going to want to call me? You know, right. Like, any of those things would not be great. Um, but what happened was kind of magic, which was boom, my trial was extended by seven days mm-hmm. just like that. And so I think, um, and I, so automation for us means both machine learning and what that can mean, but also means just removing barriers so that the user is really in as much control as they can possibly be about this subscription. Because our feeling is that if that is the case, they're going to be happier subscribers for longer um, than if they feel like you're in control of the price and the billing term and all these different things. And you want to box them into this subscription and you're yeah. trying to scam them. And you mm-hmm. know, you just want to move your elbows to get out of this thing and no, give people more agility to kind of manage their own subscription experience. Uh, I, we think will be a really powerful thing in the future. 
Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, if you take a step back and think about subscription business model and where it makes sense, a big part of how it makes sense is because of economies of scale, right? That you're actually able to take a lot of people and treat them the same very efficiently. And you might be offering them a lower price point if they had individual uh, interactions, but you treat them all the same. And now I can offer it, uh, offer it at this price point, which is really compelling. But that kind of flies in the face of what of consumers expect today, right? Everybody wants this personalized experience that's tailored to me. No, I don't care about everybody else. I care about me. Um, but you can't achieve those economies of scale with traditional methods and still treat c customers individually. The only way you're going to get there is through the, the likes of machine, machine learning, right? That's able to create these tailored experiences without a human having to sit there on the other end to do it for them. Yeah, so what, what are we kind of saying? We're kind of saying that there could be a future where it's a personalized subscription. And wouldn't that be great? Because if you could tailor a subscription to a person and do it in a highly scalable way, um, you may really be able to start attacking some of those scary metrics that they use in the boardrooms uh, to talk about how, how, how these businesses are doing. Absolutely. Well, Dan, I've loved hearing your story, hearing about the company and the problems that you guys are solving. If any of the listeners today want to get more information, how can they reach out with questions to you and learn more? learn more about NAMI. Yeah, sure. Easiest way, NAMI.ml, like machine learning. So N-A-M-I.ml. Uh, that's our website. Uh, you know, I'm on all the kind of typical social media platforms. My last name, B-U-R-C-A-W. That's the easiest way to find me. Happy to connect uh, with folks uh, anywhere and uh, answer whatever questions awesome. they have. Well, thanks again so much for the time today. I've enjoyed our conversation. Fun talking about kind of where things are and where they're going and, uh, you know, how we're solving problems out there. So thanks for coming on today, Dan. Hey, thanks, Nick. Appreciate it.